In the tumultuous era of 15th century France, when the medieval epoch was fraught with battles and religious fervor, a sinister figure loomed in the shadows of his Gothic castle, Gilles de Ray. The infamous comrade in arms of the celebrated Joan of Arc during the Hundred Years' War, Gilles de Ray held a dark and horrifying secret behind the fortified walls of his castle. Decorated as a military hero and possessing wealth and noble stature, de Ray outwardly embodied the perfect chivalric knight. Yet, as the night fell, his castle turned into a horrific chamber for the torture and demise of countless young men. But what led this highly esteemed individual to perform such heinous acts? How did de Reyes, a marshal of France and lord of many lands, manage to commit these atrocities without drawing the attention of his contemporaries for so long? Could the confines of his fortress tell the tales of horror that they were forced to witness? According to Friedrich Nietzsche's chilling remark, whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. Delve with us into the grisly history of Gilles de Rai as we unravel the dark deeds committed in the shadowy corners of his castle and attempt to comprehend how a knight turned into one of history's most horrific monsters. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. Noble beginnings, the early years of Gilles de Rai. Gilles de Rai was born in 1405 to a family with rich ancestral ties, firmly ensconced within the nobility of France. His birthplace was the castle at chantos sur loire a fortress nestled in the heart of the French countryside, resonating with the vibrant echoes of medieval grandeur. Gilles was born to Guy II de Montmorency-Laval and Marie de Crayon, both of whom hailed from illustrious lineages. Unfortunately, the untimely demise of his parents, when Gilles was just eleven, saw him and his younger brother René become orphans, set adrift in a world fraught with complexities. The brothers were taken under the protective wing of their grandfather, Jean de Crayon, a man known as much for his cunning machinations as for his noble heritage. An influential figure in the annals of French history, Jean recognized the immense potential in the Montmorency-Laval inheritance and skillfully arranged for Gilles and his brother to marry affluent heiresses to secure their wealth. Gilles was wedded to Catherine de Tours, a young woman of significant noble descent, ensuring that he, at the tender age of 16, became one of the wealthiest individuals in France. However, such sudden affluence did not detract from Gilles' lofty ambitions. He sought to elevate his stature even more, viewing his wealth not as a gift of fate, but as a stepping stone to attain greater prominence. His military aspirations were driven by the dream of a glorified France, free from the terrors of the Hundred Years' War, a turbulent period that raged on during his formative years. During this time, he was known to exhibit a remarkable affinity for martial prowess and intellectual acuity, which, when combined with his noble bearing and charismatic leadership, garnered him the adoration and respect of his peers and superiors alike. In his early adulthood, he demonstrated his courage and tactical brilliance during the Siege of Orleans in 1429, fighting alongside the legendary Joan of Arc, a bond that would leave an indelible mark on his life. There were whispers around this time of Gilles's indulgence in extravagant living. Lavish parties and extravagant banquets filled with the elite of society were a common sight at his residences. His castles resonated with the harmonious tunes of minstrels and poets who were generously rewarded for their efforts. His love for the arts was well known and he would frequently commission theatrical productions that were the talk of the nobility further cementing his reputation as a generous patron of the arts. Yet, beneath this sheen of glamour and chivalry, darker interests were budding. He developed a fascination with the esoteric, delving into the forbidden realms of alchemy and other mystical pursuits. This interest was stoked by the arrival of a Breton named François Prelati, who claimed to have arcane knowledge. He fed Gilles' curiosity, drawing him deeper into the labyrinthine mysteries of the unseen world. However, the real-life drama that unfolded in Gilles de Ray's life proved far more intriguing and horrifying than the chivalric tales he so adored. This noble-born, wealthy warrior of France, known for his gallantry and patronage of the arts, would eventually become one of history's most infamous figures. Gilles de Ray, the war-torn tapestry of a French knight. 
In the stormy tumult of the Hundred Years' War, a period marked by uncertainty and upheaval, Gilles de Rey emerged as a beacon of hope and valour for his countrymen. His military prowess, combined with a relentless dedication to the French cause, carved him a distinct place in the chronicles of this protracted conflict. His martial journey began as a young man, barely out of his teenage years, when he set foot on the battlefield in 1427. He was driven by an unshakable conviction to serve his country and free it from the English yoke. From the outset, his skill as a tactician was evident, with a strategic brilliance that often turned the tide in favour of the French forces. Gilles' military contribution reached its zenith during the historic Siege of Orléans, a monumental event that unfolded between October 1428 and May 1429. Here, he fought shoulder to shoulder with Joan of Arc, the famed Maid of Orléans, who would become a saintly figure in the pages of French history. Their camaraderie and shared zeal for their homeland created an indomitable front against the invading forces. Their combined strength and strategy led to the lifting of the siege, a turning point in the war that galvanized the beleaguered French forces. The victory at Orléans showcased Gilles's military brilliance, earning him the Marshal of France's title, a mark of the highest military distinction in the land. A phrase from that time, as brave as a lion, was often used to describe Gilles and his fearless approach on the battlefield. Another momentous event in Gilles' military career was the coronation of Charles VII at Reims in July 1429. As a mark of his military achievements and the trust the monarch placed in him, Gilles was given the honor of carrying the Holy Ampulla, a sacred vial believed to contain the anointing oil for the coronation of French kings, a gesture that firmly established his place in the inner circles of power. Gilles' military career, however, wasn't all glory and honor. It was also marred by moments of despair and controversy. He was known for his profligate spending to support his soldiers, depleting his substantial fortune on lavish equipment, medicine for the injured, and ensuring their welfare. This generous but imprudent approach led to financial troubles that would eventually shadow his later life. There was also a darker aspect to Gilles' role in the war. His tenure as the lord of several domains in Brittany brought him into contact with civilian populations, and it was during these interactions that whispers of his cruel and exploitative behavior began to circulate. These tales painted a stark contrast to the heroic figure he cut on the battlefield, hinting at the troubling duality of his character. In the shadow of the maid, Gilles de Rey and Joan of Arc. The lives of Gilles de Rey and Joan of Arc intersected at a critical junction in French history, their fates intertwining during the tumultuous times of the Hundred Years' War. Gilles, already a notable figure of French nobility and military stature, was introduced to Joan, a peasant girl imbued with profound religious visions in 1429. This encounter would create an alliance that marked a significant turning point in both their lives and the broader canvas of the war. Their meeting occurred amidst the Siege of Orléans, where Joan, claiming divine inspiration, led the charge against the English occupiers. Gilles, at first, might have been skeptical of this young maiden's prophetic claims, but her resolve and the fervor with which she spoke of her visions left a profound impression on him. Both figures, although disparate in their origins, one a nobleman and the other a shepherdess, were united by a common cause, the liberation of France. As they fought side by side, a bond of mutual respect and admiration blossomed. Joan's fearlessness and divine conviction mirrored Gilles' indomitable courage, creating a dynamic duo that invigorated the beleaguered French forces. When they achieved the unlikely victory at Orléans, it cemented their reputations as saviors of France, marking a moment of triumph that would forever link their destinies. Following the success at Orléans, Gilles continued to fight alongside Joan in several key battles, including the notable campaigns at Pâté and Jargeau. Their combined efforts culminated in the crowning of Charles VII in Reims, an event where Gilles was given the honorable task of carrying the sacred holy Ampulla. This event was a pinnacle in the alliance of Gilles and Joan, reinforcing their bond and their shared commitment to their king and country. Yet this chapter of shared triumph 
was abruptly and tragically closed with Joan's capture in 1430. Gilles, despite his military prowess and nobility, was unable to prevent her fall into enemy hands. Joan's subsequent trial and execution in 1431 were profound blows to Gilles, not only because of their friendship, but also due to the loss of a symbol of hope and unity for France. Although there are no written records of Gilles' immediate reactions to Joan's execution, one can speculate about the impact this event had on him. Some historians suggest that her death was a catalyst, accelerating Gilles' downward spiral into financial ruin and infamous deeds. The loss of such a close ally, a beacon of divine hope, could very well have pushed Gilles deeper into his fascination with the occult, seeking solace or answers in the mysterious beyond. Behind the armor, the private sphere of Gilles de Ray. Gilles de Ray, a figure largely known for his military feats and nefarious deeds, had a personal life less explored, but as intricate and significant. Born into the upper echelons of French nobility, Gilles' life was shaped by his family, his marriage and his relationships, each playing a role in the complex tapestry of his existence. In 1420, at the tender age of 16, Gilles entered into matrimonial alliance with Catherine de Tours. Catherine was a part of the influential Tours family, her status and wealth elevating Gilles' standing in the French nobility. The marriage was more a strategic maneuver than a romantic union, orchestrated by Gilles' ambitious grandfather, Jean de Crayon, to secure his grandson's financial future and social stature. Yet, despite its business-like origins, the marriage lasted over two decades and resulted in the birth of a daughter, Marie. The relationship between Gilles and Catherine was, by all accounts, as complex as the man himself. There was the public facade of the dutiful wife and the noble husband, belying the tumultuous undercurrents of financial strains and Gilles' increasingly disturbing behaviour. Despite the adversities, Catherine remained by Gilles' side, an emblem of steadfastness amidst the storm. While Gilles' relationship with his wife was fraught with tension, his bond with his daughter Marie was one marked by affection. Marie was the sole heir to Gilles' immense fortune, and he doted on her. Despite his controversial reputation, Gilles showed a softer side in his interactions with Marie, highlighting the multifaceted nature of his personality. Beyond his immediate family, Gilles' relationships extended to his close confidants and associates. One such individual was Prelati, an Italian cleric and an alchemist. Gilles, fascinated by the occult, found a willing partner in Prelati, who claimed to communicate with demons. Their alliance was a significant factor in Gilles' descent into the realm of occult practices, reflecting his longing for power and control beyond the tangible world. Interestingly, Gilles' relationships were also characterized by conflicts, particularly with his family members over the control of his vast inheritance. Gilles' impulsive and lavish spending habits often put him at odds with his relatives, leading to multiple legal battles and disputes. This tension, coupled with the mounting debt, formed a pressure cooker situation that would contribute to Gilles' eventual downfall. Feasts, follies, and financial ruin. The extravagance of Gilles de Rey. Gilles de Rey, once a celebrated war hero and the wealthiest man in France, developed a taste for grandeur that proved to be his Achilles heel. His extravagant lifestyle and prodigal spending eventually drained his coffers, setting him on a path that would lead to his downfall and infamy. His penchant for luxury was legendary. As one of the richest men of his time, Gilles had access to vast resources, and he used them liberally to fund a lifestyle of unprecedented opulence. His estates were filled with rare and valuable artifacts, his parties were the talk of the town, and his personal entourage was large and well compensated. One of the most notable displays of Gilles' extravagance was the theatrical production he financed in 1436, Le Mystère du Siège d'Orléans. This production, which chronicled the events of the Siege of Orléans, where Gilles fought alongside Joan of Arc, was on a scale unheard of at the time. The cast numbered in hundreds, and Gilles spared no expense in costumes and sets, which were adorned with lavish materials. The production lasted for several days, and every performance was free for the attendees, further depleting Gilles' wealth. 
Aside from his lavish feasts and performances, Gilles was known for his love of fine clothes. He had a personal wardrobe filled with clothes made from expensive materials like velvet, silk, and gold brocade. His love for finery was not just confined to himself. Even his servants and soldiers were dressed in high-quality uniforms, reflecting his status and power. However, this opulence came at a steep price. Gilles' extravagant lifestyle quickly drained his vast inheritance. The cost of maintaining his estates, hosting grand feasts, funding theatrical productions, and dressing his entourage in the finest attire soon outweighed his income. The strain on his finances started showing by the early 1440s. Gilles began selling off his properties to fund his expenditures. The speed at which he was selling his lands alarmed his family and led to several legal disputes. Despite these challenges, Gilles did not curb his lavish lifestyle. His love for grandeur overpowered his sense of financial responsibility, leading to a rapid depletion of his resources. Shadows and Elixirs, Gilles de Rey and the Mysterious World of the Occult In the heart of the Middle Ages, when superstition and mysterious arts held sway over people's minds, Gilles de Rey, driven by desperation and a thirst for the unknown, found himself delving into the world of the occult and alchemy. This journey into the mystical realms proved to be more than just a curious exploration. It played a significant role in the unravelling of his life and reputation. With his fortune dwindling due to his extravagant lifestyle, Gilles sought ways to replenish his wealth. The occult seemed to offer a solution, enticing him with promises of endless riches and power. It was during this period, around the early 1440s, that he crossed paths with the Italian cleric Francesco Prelati, who claimed to possess knowledge of alchemy and the ability to summon demons. Under Prelati's guidance, Gilles plunged into the world of the occult, alchemical experiments and elaborate rituals. The promise of transmuting base metals into gold seemed like a glimmer of hope amid his financial turmoil. The allure of gaining supernatural powers also appealed to Gilles, who had always been fascinated by tales of the arcane and the supernatural. In his castle at Tifoges, secret chambers were said to have been dedicated to these practices. One notable story that showcases Gilles' commitment to the occult involves an elaborate ritual called the Sanctum Regnum. This ritual, which was said to summon a demon named Baron, was carried out multiple times in the hidden corners of his castle. Gilles, desperate and on the brink of ruin, was willing to bargain his soul for a chance to restore his wealth and status. However, these dark arts proved to be Gilles' undoing rather than his salvation. As his engagement with the occult deepened, tales of his unholy practices began to spread, stirring fear and suspicion among the local populace. The association with Prelati, who was viewed with mistrust due to his background and dubious claims, further tarnished Gilles' already faltering reputation. Moreover, these practices required substantial financial support. The resources needed for the alchemical experiments and rituals further strained Gilles' coffers, leading him down an ever-darkening path. Instead of reviving his fortunes, his foray into the occult only quickened his descent into ruin. Despite the numerous rituals and experiments, Gilles' venture into alchemy yielded no gold, nor did the summoning ceremonies grant him the supernatural powers he sought. The unfulfilled promises of wealth and power only served to amplify his desperation, driving him to commit acts that would ultimately lead to his trial and execution. A terrible tale unfolds, the dark hours of Gilles de Rey. Within the veiled chapters of history rests a chilling account punctuated by unimaginable horrors committed by Gilles de Reyes, a man whose grandeur was juxtaposed by his monstrous deeds. His infamous legacy tells of torment inflicted upon those who were unfortunate enough to cross his path, particularly young men who were the primary victims of his deranged fantasies. Gilles de Reyes, the once revered Marshal of France, had his castle transformed into a nightmare's abode, a setting for the most grotesque acts one could fathom. At the height of his depravity around the 1440s, his fascination for alchemy and sorcery had grown to an extreme, and he sought to satisfy his warped desires by using the most vile means available. Notable figures such as Jean de Malestroit, the Bishop of Nantes, 
were privy to the heinous acts committed by Gilles. The bishop, appalled and disturbed by Gilles' activities, played a pivotal role in the eventual downfall of the aristocrat. It is believed that it was the bishop who first brought Gilles' actions to the attention of the public, starting the process that would eventually lead to his trial and execution. In the haunting chambers of his castle, young men were subjected to unthinkable punishments and acts of cruelty, twisted parodies of courtship rituals. They were lured into Gilles' web under various pretenses. Some promised apprenticeships, others offered sweets and games. Once inside the castle walls, however, they were trapped in a nightmare from which there was no awakening. Anecdotes of Gilles' brutal exploits filtered through the region, transforming his once respected image into a figure of fear and horror. These tales were so terrifying that they created a ripple effect, leading to an intensified fear of the nobility among the common folk. His deeds were so shocking that they led to a tightening of laws and safeguards around the protection of young men and contributed to a significant shift in societal norms. One quote that rings in the ears of those who explore the dark depths of Gilles de Ray's history is one attributed to him during his trial. The devil made me do it. This phrase has been widely discussed and analysed, with many seeing it as an attempt by Gilles to shift blame and deny responsibility for his actions. In contrast, others view it as a testament to his warped state of mind and his deep immersion in occult practices. It offers a chilling insight into the mindset of a man who had lost all semblance of humanity, succumbing entirely to his darkest impulses. While delving into Gilles's atrocities, it becomes apparent that his actions were fueled not only by his own twisted desires, but also by the dangerous substances he consumed, substances believed to have been derived from alchemical practices. These substances, which we might refer to as medieval versions of harmful medications, likely exacerbated Gilles' mental deterioration, driving him further down the path of monstrosity. Fall from Grace, the unravelling of Gilles de Ray. As the morning sun cast its light over the city of Nantes on September 13, 1440, the streets buzzed with whispers of fear and trepidation. On this fateful day, one of France's most illustrious noblemen, Gilles de Ray, found himself under arrest, a sharp descent from his once glorious stature. The charges brought against him were horrific, involving the mistreatment of countless young men and deeply disturbing rituals shrouded in darkness and mystery. The accusations emerged from the shadows like harbingers of a chilling storm casting a pall over the kingdom. Stories circulated of young men disappearing from local villages, the whispers tracing a nefarious path back to the opulent castle of the once revered knight. These allegations stoked the growing fear among the populace, turning the hero of France into an object of dread and scorn. Following his arrest, Gilles was taken to the Duke of Brittany's castle, Chateau de Nantes, where he would face the formidable Bishop Jean de Malstroy. The bishop, known for his unwavering commitment to justice, would preside over the trial. Gilles was confronted with a litany of charges, which included heinous acts against young men and involvement in ungodly practices. At the heart of these allegations was the assertion that Gilles had committed these vile acts as part of his devotion to dark rituals, a harrowing revelation that sent shockwaves through the court. In a dramatic turn of events, Gilles initially denied all accusations. He vehemently defended his innocence, even challenging his accusers to mortal combat, a challenge that was, of course, declined. However, as the trial progressed, the mounting evidence and testimonies were impossible to ignore. Among those who testified was his close associate, Francesco Prelati, the Italian cleric known for his knowledge of the occult. Prelati's damning confession, coupled with the testimonies of household staff and the parents of the missing boys, painted a grim picture of the atrocities committed within the castle's walls. Amidst this mounting pressure, Gilles eventually confessed to the horrific deeds. His admission, made on October 21, 1440, was as shocking as the crimes themselves. It's worth noting, though, that the manner of his confession was under question, as Gilles might have been subject to persuasion during his detainment. The trial of Gilles de Ray, which took place over several weeks, was a spectacle that gripped the nation. 
the image of the once celebrated war hero standing in the dock, confronted with his horrifying crimes, was a sight that would forever be etched in the historical records of France. The dusk of dread, Gilles de Ray, and the echoes of his downfall. As the 26th of October, 1440, dawned over the city of Nantes, an ominous pall of silence cloaked the cobblestone streets. The town square was thronged with people who had gathered to witness an event of unparalleled gravity. At the heart of this spectacle stood Gilles de Railly, the once revered marshal, now a convicted felon, about to face the ultimate penalty for his egregious actions. A surge of emotion swept the crowd as Gilles, in a final act of defiance, or perhaps contrition, requested the right to attend a mass before his execution. This display of religious piety from a man accused of such monstrous deeds further amplified the air of surrealism that hung over the proceedings. Gilles de Ray's execution was a public spectacle, and the onlookers watched with a mix of dread, fascination, and relief as the flames slowly consumed him. The fire that ended Gilles' life served as a stark metaphor for his fall from grace, a life that burned brightly with promise and potential only to be extinguished by the darkness within. The aftermath of Gilles' death sent ripples through the society of his time. A pall of distrust and horror hung over the nobility, and their extravagant lifestyles were viewed with suspicion. A silent paranoia began to creep into the courts and the homes of the elite. The fear that amongst them lurked another Gilles de Rays, unseen and unfettered. These sentiments were captured by a famous phrase of the time Gilles de Ray is everywhere, which became an eerie reminder of the hidden monsters that society often fails to acknowledge. On a societal level, the story of Gilles de Ray shattered the aura of invincibility that the nobility had previously enjoyed. The notion that a man of such high birth and standing could fall so low served as a stark reminder of the fallibility of human nature, regardless of one's social status. Gilles's trial and execution also led to significant changes in the legal system. The nature and the magnitude of the accusations levied against him highlighted the inadequacies of the then prevailing legal procedures. This eventually paved the way for more stringent rules concerning evidence collection, witness testimonies and trial procedures. The tragic saga of the young men caught in Gilles's dark web further underscored the importance of safeguarding the rights and welfare of the vulnerable in society. Their tragic fate brought attention to the stark social disparities of the time and the need for legal protections for the less privileged. Shadows of doubt unraveling the enigma of Gilles de Ray. As the echoes of Gilles de Ray's shocking confession in October 1440 slowly receded into the annals of history, an enduring conundrum rose from the ashes of his execution. Had justice been served, or had one of France's most esteemed noblemen been the victim of an intricate political conspiracy? With the passing of centuries, historians and scholars have grappled with this question, delving deep into the labyrinth of facts, conjecture, and half-truths surrounding this enigmatic figure. The prevailing narrative, based on the documented proceedings of the trial, painted a damning portrait of Gilles de Ray, the heroic knight turned monstrous villain. However, an alternative theory suggests that Gilles' ostentatious lifestyle, coupled with his disregard for the prevailing norms of the noble class, had made him a thorn in the side of the politically ambitious. A name that repeatedly emerges in this context is that of Jean Feve, Duke of Brittany. Gilles had reportedly sold him vast tracts of land, straining his own finances. However, the transactions were not legal under French law, which stipulated that land could not be sold without the king's permission. In this scenario, Gilles' trial and execution could be seen as a calculated maneuver to permanently seize these lands. Furthermore, Gilles's infamous reputation as a patron of the occult and extravagant spender did not sit well with the religious and societal elites of his time. His extravagant castle parties and public theatrical performances, often involving inappropriate content, earned him the ire of many in the high ranks of society. The growing discontent against his blatant disregard for social decorum, it's been suggested, played a crucial role in his downfall. Another intriguing twist in the tale revolves around the confession Gilles made. Under the law of the time, 
confessions obtained under duress or through the promise of mercy were considered valid. Gilles had been promised leniency, and some argue that this assurance led him to admit to crimes he did not commit. After all, the alternative was physical torture, a fate Gilles wished to avoid. Moreover, many historians point out the lack of physical evidence and the dubious credibility of the witnesses. Among the testimonies, many were obtained under questionable circumstances, and several others were later found to be false. This lack of irrefutable proof led to further suspicion about the veracity of the charges levelled against Gilles. Lastly, it's worth mentioning the curious case of Gilles' association with alchemy. His quest for knowledge, particularly his fascination with the esoteric, may have been perceived as a threat by the Church, leading to further animosity towards him. The Church, wielding significant power during this period, might have viewed Gilles as an uncomfortable reminder of the fine line between faith and heresy. A tarnished crown, the shifting perception of French nobility in the shadow of Gilles de Ray. In the bygone days of medieval France, the nobility enjoyed a seemingly unassailable pedestal of honor and reverence. Yet the saga of Gilles de Ray, one of the most high-ranking individuals of that time, precipitated a remarkable shift in the perception of the French nobility. This cataclysmic unraveling of a noble's dignity began with Gilles' trial and culminated in his execution in October 1440, sending tremors through the very foundations of the French aristocracy. The revelations made during Gilles' trial were shocking to say the least. This prominent figure, a comrade of the revered Joan of Arc and a Marshal of France, was accused of unspeakable acts towards young men. This unveiled the unsettling potential of a nobleman who should have been a paragon of virtue, descending into such vile actions. The fact that Gilles was a blue-blooded nobleman only added to the sense of collective disbelief and distress. The impact of Gilles' trial was twofold. On the one hand, it unmasked the unchecked power and potential for brutality that the nobility held. On the other hand, it showcased the limits of that power, demonstrating that even the noblest of the noble could be brought to justice. This event is said to have triggered a substantial recalibration of how the French populace perceived their societal superiors. One notable change was the widespread disillusionment that swept across the kingdom. Popular sayings of the time began to reflect this sentiment. One such proverb, even a nobleman can lose his way, began circulating in the taverns and markets, underlining the erosion of trust in the nobility. Another, more poignant saying was, Beware the noble's smile, for behind it may lie a Gilles de Ray. The ripples of the trial extended to the court of Charles VII as well. The king, who had previously knighted Gilles, was said to have lamented, a man of such bravery reduced to such disgrace. This public acknowledgement of Gilles' fall from grace by the monarch himself was a stark indicator of the sea change occurring within the echelons of power. Interestingly, Gilles' downfall also led to introspection and reform within the ranks of the nobility. Many began distancing themselves from the extravagance and debauchery that Gilles had personified, keen to distance their noble image from the tarnished reputation of their condemned peer. There was an increase in public demonstrations of piety among the nobility, an attempt to cleanse the noble image and reconnect with the common folk. The Gilles de Ray scandal also instigated legislative changes. His misuse of power and wealth to commit his atrocities led to stricter regulations around the treatment of serfs and the less fortunate. An ordinance dated 1441, a year following Gilles' execution, emphasized the protection of common folk, stating, No man, noble or otherwise, shall cause harm to those in his care. The Echoes of Infamy Gilles de Ray's unsettling resonance through centuries. The footprint of Gilles de Ray, a notorious figure whose life was marked by extraordinary valor, opulence, and unparalleled monstrosity, has left a profound impression on popular culture rippling through the fabric of our collective memory. From the grandeur of medieval French court life to his insidious fascination with alchemy, Gilles de Ray's complex persona has been immortalized in various artistic mediums making his legacy an enduring testament to the darkest depths of human nature. 
While his life was tragically marred by accusations and gruesome acts, Gilles de Rey has permeated the sphere of literature as a paradoxical figure of fascination. Victor Hugo, the acclaimed French novelist, ventured into this labyrinth of character exploration in his play Gilles de Rays in 1831, making a formidable attempt to decipher the man behind the infamous legend. The play wove a narrative around Gilles' duality, oscillating between his military valour and his monstrous deeds, casting a dark shadow over his life's legacy. Similarly, Marcel Schwab's collection of short stories, The King in the Golden Mask, explored the character's enigma through vivid and often haunting descriptions. The realm of music, particularly the genre of heavy metal, seems strangely attracted to the horrific tale of Gilles de Rey. Bands like Dark Moor, with their song Gilles de Rey, The Bane and the Balm, highlight the dichotomy of the hero-turned-monster. The composition encapsulates the epic and the tragic, the honour and the terror, embodying the extreme contrasts of Gilles's life. In the visual arts, the compelling image of Gilles de Rey has continued to captivate artists throughout the centuries. He is often portrayed as a figure of foreboding darkness, his stern eyes reflecting the chilling tales of his past. Particularly notable is the 19th-century French painter Eugène Delacroix's depiction of Gilles, where he appears as a tortured soul, haunted by his deeds and doomed by his choices. In more recent times, Gilles de Rey has made his mark in the world of popular media, particularly within the realm of Japanese animation known as anime. Gilles de Rey has appeared as a character in several series, including the highly popular Fate Zero. His character is often depicted with a blend of charm and madness, encapsulating the duality of his nature. Despite the passing of centuries, the fascination with Gilles de Reyes has not waned but has instead evolved, reshaping itself to fit the lens of modern interpretation. In the world of academia, Gilles' story continues to pique the interest of scholars, especially those in the field of psychology, where his life is often examined as a case study of antisocial personality disorder. The Inner Labyrinth, a psychological venture into the mind of Gilles de Rey. Diving into the psychological waters of Gilles de Rey, we come face to face with an enigma, a man of notable standing, with the spirit of a knight and the mind of a monster. What could have transformed a renowned Marshal of France, companion to Joan of Arc, into a perpetrator of such horrifying acts, particularly against young men? To comprehend the man, we must unravel the intricate threads of his psychological tapestry, painted with hues of power, obsession and delusion. Born in 1405 to a life of opulence, Gilles was introduced early to the dual themes of power and violence. The death of his father in 1415, when Gilles was merely ten, could have served as a jarring rupture in his psychological development, marking a turning point in his perception of the world and his place within it. Psychologists today might suggest that Gilles was afflicted with what is known as antisocial personality disorder, which is characterized by a long-term pattern of manipulating, exploiting, or violating the rights of others. This was notably evidenced in his warped courtship rituals with young men, where charm turned to terror as the castle doors closed behind them. Gilles' fascination with alchemy and occult practices suggests an obsessive personality, an insatiable desire to understand and control the unknown. His uncontrolled spending on these pursuits depleted his wealth, leading him into the arms of dangerous figures like the Italian alchemist Prelati. This is where Gilles was introduced to what would today be classified as dangerous substances, substances that likely heightened his detachment from reality. The infamous trial in 1440 led to a public proclamation of Gilles' disturbing actions, including the confession of his involvement in the brutal treatment of young men. His statement, The devil made me do it, points towards a psychological attempt to externalize guilt, a common trait among individuals with APD. Interestingly, this phrase has lingered in cultural memory, often quoted in discussions on the nature of evil and the capacity for denial in the face of atrocious acts. While APD might explain some facets of Gilles' behavior, his case was likely more complex. Elements of narcissism are evident in his belief in his invincibility. 
a delusion fed by his high social status and unchecked power. Moreover, it could be argued that he exhibited signs of a disorder characterized by deriving pleasure from causing harm to others. This, coupled with his uncontrolled substance misuse, likely created a volatile cocktail of psychological instability. Examining Gilles from a psychological standpoint isn't about justifying his actions, but understanding the factors contributing to his monstrous transformation. From early childhood trauma and exposure to violence, unchecked power and wealth, to an obsessive pursuit of forbidden knowledge and misuse of dangerous substances, Gilles' story serves as a stark reminder of the potential human capacity for harm when the mind is left unchecked and untreated. As we take our leave from the stormy chapters of history and the darkened corridors of Chateau de Tifoge, the haunting tale of Gilles de Ray lingers in our consciousness. Born in 1405 into the lap of nobility, Gilles strode forth onto history's grand stage, his future sparkling with promise. Yet he chose a path of shadow and despair, one that led him to a gruesome end on October 26, 1440. One cannot help but ponder the enigma of Gilles, a gallant hero in the Hundred Years' War, a companion of the saintly Joan of Arc, and yet an alleged tormentor of innocent young men. His story prompts us to ponder the mysteries of the human spirit, capable of both soaring bravery and chilling malevolence. A famed French saying encapsulates this duality. Man is neither angel nor beast, and the unfortunate thing is that he who would act the angel acts the beast. Indeed, Gilles' tale serves as a timeless reminder that power, unchecked, can distort the noblest of souls. As we part ways with the chilling saga of Gilles de Ray, his legend lingers as a spectre over the annals of French nobility, a stark cautionary tale of how glory can descend into infamy. For as history has often shown us, nobility in name is but a fragile facade. It is the nobility in actions that truly defines a man, until we meet again, may we ponder on these echoes from the past that they might inform our steps into the future.